All right, next up, we have uh, Stephen Newman from Princeton uh, talking about uh, his, his paper, uh, Decentralization Cheapens Corrupted Majority Attacks. So let's give it up for Stephen. So I'm here to talk about majority attacks, as we've been talking about for something like 15 years now. Um, anyone who has been around the blockchain space for even a little bit of time knows that majority attacks are a danger, um, and it probably assumes that they're not a major one, despite the fact that we have seen at least a few of them in the real world at this point. So I'd like to talk about why, and I'd like to argue that they might be a little bit more of a danger than we think. So historically speaking, the argument that they're not a danger has taken kind of the skin in the game for, right? The idea first proposed by Nakamoto that miners, any, or at least any miner who could run a majority attack really has too much at stake to want to do it for any sort of reasonable price, right? A miner sees the vast majority of their value as coming in the future, right? The mining rewards over the course of, say, the next few years before their hardware goes out of date or whatever. And so to get them to run a majority attack, you would really need to pay them enough money to offset that. Budish formalized this circa 2018, right? He argued that what you have to do is you have to explicitly calculate the miner's expected future reward, say, you know, a Bitcoin miner who expects to earn a billion dollars every year for the next few years, and then you have to pay them that to make them attack. Because once they attack, the chain will substantially devalue, and so their rewards will substantially devalue. Kind of the most optimistic assumption for defense is that the chain will totally devalue, and so we have to really pay them everything they would expect to earn in the world where there was no attack. Um, if you do out the math on the Budish attack, what you get is an attack that costs on the order of a few percent of the total Bitcoin in existence, for Bitcoin, for instance, about, say, $10 billion. This is potentially dangerous. It's hard to say. It's kind of right on the edge of where you might be able to start making money off of this. We're going to argue that it gets a lot more dangerous than that. Um, a little bit of history here, Joe Bonneau proposed um, a slightly different variety of majority attack in 2016. We get this idea of corrupting miners as opposed to kind of buying your own ASICs or what have you. The idea here is that this is more practical, right? You don't have to try to corner the market on mining hardware. And it's potentially also more dangerous since you don't have to dilute mining power by adding more to the system. But critically, it's not clear that it has quite the same incentives as a simple majority attack of the sort like Budish talks about, right? It might be that there's something more dangerous going on here. I think in that paper, there's a little section about how there might be a tragedy of the commons effect. And indeed, we can immediately see that in a kind of idealized bad case, there is such an effect, right? If all of your miners are very small, then it's actually very easy to run a kind of short-term majority attack, right? What you can do is you can say, all right, we're going to wait until the next several blocks are all mined by miners who are very small, or we'll just try this whenever we think that this might happen, and say, look, while this miner is very small, their expected future mining rewards are relatively low, so we can pay them their fractional bootish payout, right? The exp their personal expected future mining rewards for the rest of time. And that just turns out not to be very big. So we pay, say, 20 miners that much money, and assuming all the miners are very small, what we get is a cheap attack that goes 20 blocks back into the past. This is not very dangerous in the real world, right? Because if we look at most cryptocurrencies now, we see a lot of medium-sized miners, right? Think on the scale of somewhere between 0.1% and a few percent of total mining power, though it's hard to say. I'll get more on that later. So the question is, is there another issue? And the answer, as it turns out, is yes. Um, the Budish payout, which we already discussed, is, as we said, paying each miner their expected loss as a result of the attack succeeding. Um, this is clearly enough. However, it's not clearly necessary. And in fact, we can immediately see cases where it might not be necessary, right? Um, the simple case that I have up there is, if you have a miner who already believes that the attack is guaranteed to succeed, the Budish payout is really missing the point in this specific case, right? Because that miner isn't losing anything from their actions participating in the attack. The attack was already going to go through. They have no expected long-term rewards to lose. And more generically, if we see some sort of miner who just won't affect the attack success very much by their actions, right? Say a small miner, or a miner who only plans to mine one block over the duration of the attack. Then they should be able to look at the scenario and say, well, look, my expected future rewards for mining aren't really going to change much if I act, because, that is, if I attack as opposed to defend, because the probability that the attack succeeds will only really be marginally affected by my actions. 
So bribing this person, we should expect to cost a much lower fraction of their total future revenue. So moving towards an attack, we almost just stated what the payout rule is going to be, right? Um, if we have a miner and they mine an attacking block, what we would like to do is come up with some sort of model for attack success likelihood in any sort of partial attack state, right? Say we've set a time threshold on our attack. We've mined some attacking blocks. Everyone who's not participating in the attack has mined some defending blocks. Um, and we have some sort of explicit expression for how likely we think the attack is to succeed at any point in time. Um, that means that we can model the change in attack success likelihood if someone mines an attacking block as opposed to a defending one. And that means we can pay that person exactly what we believe that they lost as a result of mining that attacking block. That is enough to incentivize them to help us in the attack. So the issue is that this isn't really constant across miners, right? If we have a much bigger miner, they have much more to lose as the result of an attack success, and therefore we would have to pay them. We don't like this. Um, first of all, it means that we can't do a neat payout rule, but it also creates kind of bigger problems for us. It might incentivize people to gang up and form larger mining pools who we would have to pay more. It's not good. So the way we deal with this is we just threshold it. We say, all right, we're going to do all of our payouts as if the miners that we are paying have fractional power gamma, say like 1% of the total mining power. And what this gets us is that if, mining, if we have most miners at or below that mining power, then we'll have incentivized the ones at that mining power, and we'll also have incentivized the ones below that mining power, right? They have less to lose, so the payout that we're giving them is more than enough. So why does this become cheap? Why is it actually dangerous? Once we commit to this payout rule, once we commit to paying a majority of miners enough to incentivize them to participate in our attack, what we end up with is an attack that looks a lot like a random walk, right? If we have some sort of fraction of miners defending, um, then every time one of them gets to mine a block, the attack lag increases by one, right? How far we are from getting a longest chain. And when one of our majority attackers mines a block, the attack lag decreases by one. So what we have is, in fact, a biased random walk that is moving towards the origin, right? Attack success. So if we set our attack time threshold high enough, if we commit to running our payouts for long enough, then eventually our attack is going to succeed with very high probability, right? Biased random walks concentrate very well. And once we have an attack that succeeds with very high probability, it means that our payouts actually get to be very low, right? Because if the attack is very high probability, it's also very high probability contingent on any given block. So no one has incentive to deviate because just that one deviation is going to have very low impact on the attack success chance, therefore very low impact on their expected future rewards, and therefore what we have to pay them is relatively little. So this gets us a theorem. Um, if we run an attack, as I said above, doing this random walk analysis gets us an attack that has relatively low time to attack success, about as low as it could be, given that all of the miners below that th power threshold actually join us, or at least the fraction we assume. Um, moreover, the time to success concentrates exponentially. And also, the attack cost is very low. It's, in fact, as low as it could be, right? Um, that number listed is the number of blocks before the attack succeeds times the reward. And we expect the attack cost to be only times the block reward. And we expect the attack cost to be only a little bit more than that. This is really a dramatic reduction from the bootish attack cost, which is a payout to you know, at least a majority miner of what they expect to mine in the next three years, right? This is more like a payout of what they expect to mine over the next three days or next three weeks, right? Depending on the duration of the attack. The worst case attack cost is really bad, right? Um, if it turns out that the attack goes wrong, that the defenders mine a lot more blocks than they should have been able to, and that in the end it comes down right to the wire on this time threshold, right? That the last few miners get a lot of impact on whether the attack is going to succeed or fail. Then the attack cost can go very high. However, this really shouldn't occur unless mining power is really improbably coordinated. That is to say, some constant but not very large fraction of the mining power that we expected to attack decides to defend. So, and this is the phenomenon that I talked about, this concentration of cost. Once we set the time threshold large, right, once the attack is very likely to succeed within the time threshold over which we've committed to payouts, the attack cost starts to drop off really hard. And in fact, we can run some real numbers on this, right? We can just explicitly calculate all of these quantities for certain choices of the parameters. If we assume that about 60% of miners are a, each less than 5% of total mining power on Bitcoin, and B, can be bribed, right? They'll, they're willing to take bribes that um, increase their expected value over 
just not taking bribes, we get an attack that doesn't cost very much. It's about an order of magnitude below the bootish bound. It's about $300 million at the time of writing, right? Um, if we tweak the parameters a little bit, and I'll get more into this, um, the cost goes substantially down, right? We go from $300 million to $30 million. That starts to look really dangerous. That starts to look like the sort of thing that you could potentially make a lot of money off of via a double spend or a short or what have you. On the point of the parameters, the issue here is that we just don't know a lot about the distribution of large miners in most of these ecosystems. Miners have some incentives to hide it because they don't want people playing silly games against them. Um, so we just don't have a good idea of exactly what parameters you would need to set to make this attack actually feasible. So mitigating this is a little tricky. There are a couple ways we could go about it. I'll start by talking about um, kind of the economic ways we could attempt to prevent people from doing this. On a protocol level, there's not a lot we can do, right? For simple proof of work currencies, majority attacks are almost the intent, right? If we have a majority of mining power, we would like to be able to set the chain. There are tricks you can do like um, say what ETH does, right? Weak subjectivity. So just assuming enough information that you can't do a long-term reversion attack. This does prevent long-term attacks assuming it works, but it has its own issues. Um, a couple of other defenses that people have proposed. On the counterattack front, um, these are very effective as a defense, assuming that you have an entity that's willing to do counterattacks, and also assuming that the only way attackers can take profit is by doing double spends, right? And hoping that the double spends end up being long-term successful. They fail as a deterrent if the attackers can take profit via other methods. So the scenario you want to think of here is an attacker that decides to short the chain and then run this attack on the premise that as soon as someone starts running this attack, no matter if there's a counterattack or not, the attack of, or the value of the associated cryptocurrency will drop dramatically. Um, Bono also proposed counter bribery. For various reasons, including those he discussed, this is really just undesirable as a way to prop up our chain. Coalitions are kind of a natural thing you would think of to try to prevent this attack, right? We talked about a thresholding rule that pays enough to make lower miners participate. So we might assume that if you make larger miners out of your smaller miners, you won't get an attack. This turns out not to work. We can always just pay people enough to incentivize them to defect. And in fact, mining pools turn out to make things worse, not better. The last one, and this is possibly the most promising on this page, is if you can actually just remove the incentives to run an attack, like remove the ability um, to double spend effectively, which turns out to be very hard to do, or remove the ability to short effectively, which might be easier to do, then you might be able to just knock away at at least some of the incentives to run something like this. On a non-economic level, um, the first and kind of more hopeful reason that we might be able to prevent this is if people just didn't want to participate, if everyone were enough of an idealist to say, well, look, I realize that this will get me a little expected value, but I really believe in Bitcoin, or I really believe in you know, generic proof of work cryptocurrency, and I'd rather not do it for the sake of my own heart. This has not worked in the past, right? We know that people play various sorts of timing games and mining games. We've already seen some of them today, in fact. And I don't think that there is a good reason to believe that if someone comes out proposing a bribe that will in fact be profitable for people, that they won't take it just out of kindness or altruism or whatever. On a much more pragmatic level, we have another enforcement mechanism, and that's force. Um, historically speaking, various entities have been willing to inter intervene when people start trying to play silly games, trying to do majority attacks. The US SEC might take an interest, for instance, if someone tried to run a majority attack on Bitcoin. This is potentially a very useful way to deny these attacks. It's not clear how effective it is in practice. Really, we would need to try it and find out. The two primary factors that are going to influence this are whether the actors who really want to prevent these have the ability to bring a force and the vulnerability of the attackers and the participants, right? The people who are getting bribed to this force, right? You want to think of whether your miners are susceptible to regulation, whether they could be locked up by the US government, whether they could be assassinated by the North Koreans for you know, taking away their easy way to make money, that sort of thing, right? So where does that leave us? First of all, this attack isn't easy. It's not quick to coordinate. It would take a lot of setup. It's not clear that it's that hard, but it would certainly take some time. No one's going to run this tomorrow. On incentives, um, I think it's been said better than I can already say it, right? Um, there are questions that we have around incentives. They have not been analyzed carefully enough in the past. It's important to do so before things go really dramatically wrong. And lastly, on the bigger picture, I think it's really important, once we have a better idea of the incentives, 
to look at what the things are that protect our blockchains in practice, right? not just in these idealized economic models, and look at what they mean for how we're going to use these and how we want to use these in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it certainly introduces uh, interesting questions around how the decreasing block reward on Bitcoin in particular may play into account the cost of some of these attacks as well. Yeah, any questions? Sure. Let me get you the uh, microphone here. So I have a question uh, regarding your thoughts on the really large miners, particularly the ones that are publicly traded or have issued equity in their company, since this is kind of a way of pulling forward some of that future value. And it's taking a lot of that value that you would normally have in the security model as the expectation of profit of the miner itself. And it's that risk is being bared by another party. So the miner itself now has seemingly even less incentive to worry about those cash flows as long as they've sold the equity, as long as they've sold the stock. Do you have any thoughts on miners essentially de-risking themselves through the public markets and, and the impact that that could have on security or, or the cost of bribing? Yeah, so equity here is a really important point. I'm glad you asked about that. Um, one of the things that I'd like to go back to here is this is kind of the same thing that makes mining pools potentially very dangerous here. If you have someone whose personal long, who has control over the mining power, but whose personal long-term rewards are not well tied to the long-term rewards given by that mining power, right? So for instance, the CEO of a company who controls a lot of ASICs, or alternately, the person who decides what people mine in a large mining pool, but only gets 1% of the future rewards of that pool, they become dramatically cheaper to mine, right? Now, in the case of a CEO, you've also got other factors, right? If they do this and they lose a bunch of future profits, right? This could open them up to shareholder lawsuits. This could open them up to SEC enforcement, that sort of thing. But they could also just get on a plane and go to a non-extraditable country, right? So you have to worry about both things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Great. Um, are there any like safe distributions for mining powers? So, for example, we can say that normal distribution with many miners would be kind of on the dangerous side. If you have a uniform distribution with like uh, like one or two miners, it's probably on the safe side. Do you right. have any thoughts on that? So, what's what like, this implies is that the closer you are to having a true majority miner, the safer you are, right? Mm -hmm. And now this is problematic for philosophical reasons, right? We like to think of these as decentralized. It's hard to look at look up there and say, well, look, we're actually safest when we have an enormous miner, right? But so what this is saying is if you have 12 miners who are each 5% miners and one miner who's a 40% miner and all of them are profit driven, you can run a $300 million attack. Now, if you change that 40% miner to a 51% miner, that turns into Budish's kind of $5 billion attack. I don't know how to get better than that in that case. So this, what we're looking at here is something very counterintuitive in terms of safe distribution. It turns out that centralization is safer in this case, or at least makes bribes more expensive. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Let's give it up for Stephen. All righty, and then the, uh, the last talk of the uh, consensus session uh, is post-quantum single secret leader election, SSLE, from publicly re-randomizable 